welcome to Inspiration Inc. I have a very special guest with me. He wears many hats, but we are going to talk about his life, his inspiration, and more than anything else, uh, his journey. Uh, we have Mr. Robin Rana with us, Chairman and President of Ebix. Uh, sir, thank you so much for joining us on Times Network, and uh, it's a pleasure having you on this show. But uh, you know, I want to go back to uh, the beginning because uh, I mean, you do a lot of, uh, like I said, you wear many hats. So apart from running a very successful business, which is expanding so rapidly, you are equally involved in charity globally. You are equally uh, involved in uh, promoting entrepreneurship and a lot of things. But uh, but I'll start with something uh, which is which will take you back to the beginning of your journey, how it all started. Well, look, I, you know, I'm a Kashmiri Hindu born in Kashmir, and my parents moved to Punjab a long time back, and uh, so I did my schooling with uh, Our Lady of Fatima Convent uh, School in uh, Patiala, and then I did my engineering out of Patiala. So that's the short story of my. You know, but you wanted to get into, into medical, if I'm not wrong. That's absolutely true. So I was, <laughs> I was thinking of going into a medical school. So in 12th, you have to specialize in something, and I thought I'll do pre-medical, as they say. And then Blue Star happened. And when Blue Star happened, uh, you know, I wanted to appear in exams for the top medical schools across the country, and we couldn't appear because our exams were delayed that year. Mm. So now I had to either make a choice of appearing for it next year. And I just decided at the spur of the moment, look, I, I've changed my thinking. I want to be a, an engineer. And I studied for additional maths and went for engineering. You know, uh, part of it was, it wasn't like that I was so addicted to becoming a doctor. When you're 12, you know, at that stage of your life, you're not so sure uh, where you want to head. And you, uh, so I kind of made that change at that time, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I mean, now in hindsight, do you ever wonder or do you ever think if you would have become a doctor, then what would have happened? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I think about it, but at the same time, now that you say it, I don't know how successful or a failure I would have been as a doctor. I think it's a tough profession. Uh, people like me are probably not fit to be doctors. Uh, the reason I say that is I'm very uh, emotional. Um, I can't see pain. Hmm. Um, and if I'm a doctor and I have to, you know, doctors have to see pain every day, and be very, you know, have to wear a mask on their, on their face, and which is very hard for me to do. Like I just can't deal with pain, uh, especially in other. I, it just moves me a lot. So I probably would have been a failure as a doctor. But uh, and you know, this this is the contradiction which I always uh, thought that I'll ask you about. So on one hand, you're you're really emotional as a person, and and you get moved. In fact, I'm told the your biggest charity project in India, which is building 6,000 homes for homeless uh, people uh, near Delhi. Uh, it happened because you saw uh, some of those slums getting uh, removed and things like that. So, so that was the emotional side of you. On the other hand, you are a very sharp, focused, almost shark-like business person, business personality who has been on an acquisition spree and you are in the middle of <laughs> one more acquisition plus IPO. So, I mean, is it natural? It, does it come naturally to you? How do you balance both of them? I think it actually complements each other. In my mind, this is, uh, it's kind of important to have feelings. If you don't have feelings, you won't have your feet on the ground. You will mm. lose your humility. You also need to feel the pain of others. But I somehow can't see pain in others, especially when they're underprivileged. So that's something I was born with, something I, I just, I don't know where it came from, but it has been there with me it actually brings a perspective in my life. It kind of calms me down on my business side. So as a businessman, when you are looking at opportunities, uh, ultimately you're an, you have to be an opportunist. You have to be sh quick. You have to be better than others, which means you have to, if you can operate at a faster speed than others and still be very analytical and be rational and keep your feet on the ground where you're not overthinking about money, all you need to do is think rationally about things, look at the best side, but also look at the worst side of your decision. And if you can live with the worst side, that if the worst happens, it's not taking your company down in any manner, then that's a, and you think the best is fantastic, then you make a very balanced decision. This emotional side of yours, or this, uh, uh, you know, very active EQ, does it ever overpower the business sense, or I would say the IQ part of it? 
Uh, not really. I will tell you one of the things I've learned, and I say this, um, when I come to my work, I don't bring my um, personal side into my work. Now, of course, you'll have something in your mind, you're, you know, you're emotional, you're always going to think about trying to do the right thing for people. But for example, uh, I don't bring my charity hat to work. I always say that, <laughs> I, I always say that, as a, have, believe in compassionate capitalism. I'm a big believer in compassionate capitalism. But at the same time, do charity with your own money. Don't do charity with investor money. Don't do charity with, with your company's money. Because there are other investors who own a share of it. It's not fair for me to be making a decision for them, but it's a fair for me to make a decision with my own money, my personal money. So what I do is I don't bring my charity hat to office. I make rational decisions. But when I'm making those business decisions, sometimes you make very tough decisions. For example, you have to fire people. That's not an easy decision if you're going to fire a few hundred people. And you know that's the right thing because you just acquired a company which is sinking and you need to turn it around. But you're also emotional. You're thinking, well, I'm going to take away the livelihood of some of these people. But you have to kind of draw that balance as a businessman. You have to start thinking through, look, if I don't do that, I might put the remaining thousand people's job in jeopardy. So you have to be rational about these things and, uh, and keep your feet on the ground while making these decisions. So when, uh, you know, I mean, when you, when you landed a job in US and when you started working there, can you share your initial experience? Did you ever think, I mean, uh, were you always this ambitious and you always thought that you'll make it big, you'll create a company which will get into fortune list and uh, at the same time, uh, you'll do uh, remarkable charity work. Was that always planned or it just happened or it kept following one after the other? See a few things. When I was growing up in India itself, um, early days when I was a child, people used to ask me, what do you want to be as you grow up? I never said I want to be a doctor or an engineer. I used to say I want to be famous. <laughs> and so that was a kid. I was a kid at that time. When I went to the US, I realized a few things. One is that I'm landing up in a new country wherein I'll face some amount of discrimination. And I wasn't shaken by it simply because I felt that's very natural if an American lands up in India, they will also have to deal with some amount of discrimination. But soon I realized there is one color that America respects. That's the color of money. Money. And if I can be good at my task and deliver for my shareholders and deliver money, then I will start getting equal respect as anybody else locally. And that's what I tried to, tried to focus on. Now, with respect to saying whether I'm ambitious, I don't, really don't think I ever was ambitious. For me, there was, there's one kick I always had, and that was that whatever sector I enter, I want to be different. I want to pioneer. So when I went into, let's say, our industry, software industry, designing systems for insurance industry, or finance and so on, I wanted to pioneer new trends worldwide. For me, it wasn't about emulating the most successful businessmen or emulating the most successful software setup. For me, it was creating new, pioneering new things that could change the lives of the industry, change the lives of people. That's what has driven me always. And today, even when I look through things, I don't really think through for how much money will I personally make? Where will I reach the next stage? Do I have a goal for charity? Do I have a goal for business? I think my goals are simple. I want to drive shareholder value, but I want to do it while bringing change, right? I want to do stuff which is new. For example, when I'm in India today, uh, I have this so-called desire that I'd like to create an MNC out of India that can spread across the world and going by what Mr. Modi says, make in India. I mm -hmm. want to do that, a make in India product set that can be taken across the world and create a giant MNC which can be, can be the size of uh, the next oracle. The next, you know, something big that can happen. I genuinely believe, is it possible in my lifetime? I believe so. I actually believe it's possible in my lifetime. And, you know, and that's the effort journey I'm on. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, so that's one part of it, but you did face discrimination when you went to US and in fact, uh, you have been through so many ups and downs, even on the business side and uh, including 
uh, I would say really ferocious attack from hedge funds and all when they were hammering your stock uh, in NAS on Nasdaq and all. How did you deal with that? Yeah, I'll tell you. Look, my business never went through ups and downs. The discrimination was there, so all planted stories, stories were being planted, anonymous stories were being planted, anonymous attacks were happening, but at no point did the business suffer. I'm very proud of the last 20 years of history of my company. We've had 80 quarters, 8-0, 80 quarters of sequential growth, right? Not only in terms of revenue, but in terms of operating income, right? So, but in the meanwhile, there were insinuations, shorting of the stock, trying to bring the stock down. How did I react to it? I never said one negative word about the short or a hedge fund. All I thought was cash does the talking, numbers do the talking. If we can keep delivering, these shorts will die. And what we also did in the meanwhile, I told my board and I told my shareholders, as a company we need to be opportunistic. If somebody drives your stock price down, you buy low. Hmm. You buy your stock low and you retire it. Your EPS is going to go up, your earning per share will go up. And what I did was, today, if you look at the last decade's journey, 40 million shares of EBIT are now 30 million shares, 30.6 million shares, which means we purchased stock. Our earning kept going up virtually all through. And the stock, the you know, the hedge funds brought the stock down to $9 doing, I believe in one simple thought process which is believe in common sense maths make your selling price a lot more than the cost price and stick to the basics you have been on an acquisition spree lately and and like i said you are in the middle of one acquisition which is still unfolding for you and then obviously you shared your ambition of uh, creating a large MNC in India, you know, which which can which can be a dominant player globally. Can you give us a rough idea what kind of uh, uh, MNC you have in mind or what, what space you are looking at? So I'm focusing right now in creating, I want to create an ecosystem of insurance, finance and healthcare. Mm -hmm. See, first of all, it's a totally different paradigm shift in thinking. What is today happening in India and the rest of the world? People work in silos trying to sell insurance somebody providing back-end systems, somebody is trying to provide telemedicine, ultimately consumer is the same. If you are the True. consumer and you want 20 different services and you want to, let's say, fly to Rome, if you're going to fly to Rome, you need a flight ticket, you need a hotel ticket, you need your visa, you need, you, you need foreign exchange, you need health insurance, travel insurance, cars, cabs, and so on. Do you want to go to 10 players to do that or can you do it in one simple swoop and data should flow, systems should flow. I want to create an ecosystem where everything can happen in minutes. And providers get efficiency, consumers get efficiency, and in the process you create a value chain. That's the IP that I want to create, and we've been on this journey of creating this IP. Today in India, what we have been able to do, we've created the largest financial ecosystem that India has seen. Hmm. We conduct in excess of 15 billion dollars of GMV today in India and we've done it very highly profitably. So we want to create the IP within India, keep all the backend stuff in India, the design knowledge, the product creation in India and then spread out a financial come insurance, come healthcare ecosystem across the world. It's your uh, ambition on the business side of it but personally and, and I want to go back to, uh, to the moment when you actually thought that you want to build uh, homes for uh, people living in the slums. And, and there's a very interesting story that I think uh, you were on the rooftop of your building and you saw a couple of slums uh, and, and people who are living there, they were being forced to leave uh, that place. So can you just uh, explain how it happened and what triggered this uh, initiative? See, in 2003, I came to India and we were in, I went on the fourth floor of one of our buildings in Noida. And I was sitting absent-mindedly uh, thinking of something about the next deal, some power kick, something. And I looked absent-mindedly at the back and I saw a lot of slums. I started crying. I came down and my chief financial officer, Richard Baum from Chicago was there with me. 
And he said, why are you crying? And I said, I saw slums. He said, you're an Indian. You've seen slums all your life, so what are you crying about? And I said, no, Dick, I'm not crying because I saw slums today. I'm crying because these slums were always there. I've been coming to this building for three years. I never saw these slums. I said, the problem I have is I have eyes and yet I can't see. I only see what I want to see. I come in this Mercedes, come in these top swanky offices, and I don't see poverty around me. I said, what is my life? What am I living for? And it just occurred to me, what have I really done in my life? I looked at the last 10 years and I said, what is it that I'm proud of personally? And I wasn't. It didn't matter to me the business, fortune, force, why? It didn't give me that kick. And I said, what have I done for others? Mm. What have, and, and I used to help charity from my, you know, in my own way directly. And it occurred to me that I needed to do something in an institutional way. And that's where the idea of the Robin Rana Foundation was born. In 2003, somewhere around that period, the Congress government decided we're going to launch uh, Commonwealth Games. And they decided to clean Delhi of slum dwellers and move yeah. them to Bhavana. Created the second largest slum in the Asian subcontinent after the Ravi. I went to Bhavana in those days and created a few schools on, those were like Anganwadis within the mm. slums. Soon we realized, another six months we realized, kids were studying and then they would move because their parents would look for livelihood and would move because they were like nomads. In 2006, we conceptualized this project to build 6,000 concrete homes, free of cost for the slum dwellers. And we put only two conditions. One, you can't sell this home for seven years. And secondly, your kids must go to school. That's our main condition, especially for the girl child because a lot of them were Muslims and they weren't putting their kids into a girl child into school. So we made that a prime condition and then started building these homes and now we have handed over 2,304 homes already and we run lots of schools there and people have stayed and it's a 30% of that area is not a slum today. Right. And my goal is to finish the word, the colony is called Jugi Jopri Colony, JJ Colony, Bhavana. I'd like that JJ word to go away someday so that it's not seen as a slum area. Which is the uh, happiest moment of your life so far? It's a very hard question uh, to come up with because I really haven't thought of it. Um, I think um, probably I think seeing your uh, kids be born uh, is probably a very happy uh, moment. I think it's very difficult to describe when you have my son is a tennis player for example. Sometimes I see him uh, play a league match and it becomes like a happy moment for me. It gives me more happiness uh, to see him play at the level that he plays tennis uh, than the biggest kick I would get out of a business deal. What you would personally consider as the uh, lowest point or the most challenging uh, phase of your life? See, I think it was around 2013. Uh, mm -hmm. In 2013, uh, I was getting viciously attacked. Uh, by hedge funds in the US and it's one thing to get attacked it's another thing when your integrity people write anonymous messages and try to challenge your integrity it's very tough to even respond because you don't know who's writing it why are they saying what they are saying and you're trying to keep your head high because you don't want to you don't want to dignify it with a response so that was on one side uh, we lost market cap, the stock, uh, because they shorted 40% of our stock in half an hour hmm. uh, to follow it up with all this anonymous kind of campaign. So I wasn't so put off with the stock price. Frankly, I, I nev I'm never attached to it. But this attack, a vicious attack that came through uh, was something, was a low point for me uh, because I felt that I deserve a little bit better, you know, and you felt, I felt very discriminated at that time in the U.S. As time went on, I never showed my emotions to anybody, but I was obviously very put off internally. Disturbed. But I realized that, look, there's only one way to answer it, and that is through performance. Time is a big healer, as long as you can keep performing. And what happened time and time again, we were proven right. There was no, you know, all the negativity that was being planted kept going out. But who would you, uh, I mean, who is the most inspirational person in your life? See, it's a, it's a, it's a number of people. Uh, mm -hmm. If I look at the, at the business side of things, I would, I would give you two names. Um, Mr. Buffett and Mr. Steve Jobs. 
um, I, I love Mr. Buffett for his simple style of thinking. Selling price has to be a lot more than the cost price. That's basically what I've always believed in. Uh, I look up to Mr. Buffett for all the charity work he's doing. It's one thing to donate money. It's another thing to give that money away to Mr. Bill Gates' foundation, not to his own foundation, and say, Mr. Bill Gates, I believe in you. Just go out and spend this money, right, on good causes. That takes a lot of guts and shows your selfless nature. Mr. Steve Jobs, for me, has always been, was always an enigma because he had this passion for design. He had the passion for excellence. Mr. Steve Jobs genuinely believed he was changing the lives of people, which he did. He changed the lives of the whole world. On, on, uh, the, on my Personally. normal personal side, uh, I look up to my dad and mom. Um, and and uh, there's a gentleman in India uh, who I highly respect. When I started my job, I worked under a gentleman by the name Mr. Arun Sena. Uh, okay. Till date, he remains my guru. I, I, uh, I, I just feel everything I have learnt in my life and earned uh, is courtesy Mr. Sinha. If there is one thing that you could change about your life, would you really want to change something about your uh, life? I don't think so. I, yeah. I don't think so because uh, look, when you can look back at your life and probably say this one thing, one small thing you should have done differently. But uh, you know what, this is a journey, 2013 experience. It's taught me so much. It's taught me more humility, it's taught me more, uh, you know, given me a perspective in life. Last year I had an accident where I broke my legs. I basically, my femur broke and my car overturned in the U.S. Uh, April of last year. And it taught me, first of all, how, how uh, fragile are we are, right? And it taught me that everything that goes up has to come down. And, and I realized that when you come down in people's eyes, if you're successful and if you're happy at that time, people might think you're coming down, but you might be very happy, then you're successful. So I've realized that the journey of having that accident by itself, right? It was a painful phase for 12 months or 10 months to be on crutches. And, but it gave me a perspective on life. It made me more humble. It taught me that life is so fragile. What are you, why am I overthinking things, right? I could die in a microsecond. So I think you don't want to change it. These are things which, you know, with every failure or mm. every hit that you get, you learn to walk a little bit differently. One last quick question before we wrap up. I'm told this entire office is designed by you. So what's the thought process behind having such a colorful, lively and almost fun-like place, you know, when you are into a serious business? <laughs> Look, I, I feel that, uh, what is India about? So this is our India headquarters, and India is about youth today. This is a country where, you know, meaning 65% of our population is approaching the age of 35, one of the youngest societies in the world. What does youth like? Youth likes anything which is hip, anything which is fashionable, right? And today, I, when we were designing this office, uh, I've designed all the headquarters of EBEX, India headquarters as well as, you know, played a role in the headquarters of uh, US also. It's a much different building. But when you look at the India one, I conceptualized virtually everything in every detail. Part of it was I felt when this youth comes into your office every day, they should feel this is not a workplace. They should feel they're so proud of the place today that when they go back, they should, you know, you, there's no timing to work. If you True. work in a place where you have these fashion cafes and you have amazing gyms and all kinds of food items and you get Chinese and American and Indian and we subsidize all, we basically give free food and stuff and people feel very relaxed and if you're relaxed you make better decisions. That's, that's really interesting. It's been a pleasure Robin speaking to you and uh, I wish you all the best for your future dreams, for your future ambitions and also uh, I wish you lots of luck to achieve much greater heights in the charity work that you are doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks.